thank you for everyone who served. Father God, we just bring glory to your name this day. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming in this place. Father God, we thank you for just setting up habitation in this room. We thank you for touching every heart, for touching every mind, for touching every spirit. We thank you, God, that we may usher in your glory with thanksgiving and praise. Oh, we love you so much, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Say, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh, my soul, and worship Your holy name, oh, bless the Lord. 
his hands raised all across this place. This is why you came here this morning, right? This is why we're here, to worship him, to worship him.
I saw a chessboard and I saw a number of pieces being moved on the chessboard. Then I heard the sound of the war drums and they seemed like they had surrounded me. They were in all different places all around. Each one had a different code and a different sound. And the Lord says, know that in this hour I'm going to reveal the mysteries even to those that are crying out to me at the throne, says the Lord. Those that are interceding on behalf of others and those that are crying out for my kingdom, says God. I'm going to reveal even the strategy of the enemies that you can do battle in this season of war, says the Lord. No, stay centered in my will and in my purpose, says God. For this is an hour you shall hear things, but quiet your heart in the midst of my peace, says the Lord. For truly in the midst of everything, know that I'm going to give you my shalom, says the Lord. I'm going to make a path forward for my church now. Be right and be ready, says the Lord, for lots of things are going on. Lots of things are happening on each and every front, says the Lord. But the victory is ours and the victory time is now.
saw three things this morning. I saw Kelty on a tightrope with a balance beam, and she was making it across a long stretch. But with the balance beam, she was making it across. Then I saw a kite in the spirit, and I heard people's frustration saying, my God, Jesus, please cut me some slack. Like how a kite needs slack in the string to go higher. Then I saw a boom box with double speakers. And in classroom seven here in Lola, we really need a CD player slash boom box to connect our TVs, videos, etc. And this is what I heard the Lord say. Y'all are coming to the end of the tightrope. Prayer has carried you all the way across. And yes, some of you are sick and tired of waiting for many situations to change. But the Lord says, know that my hand is moving. Even where you can't see it moving, don't give up. And for Lola, the Lord says, Lola gets a double portion, period. This generation belongs to me. The music, the worship, the sound, the beat, they will worship me in spirit and in truth and excel in their minds. For the Lord would say unto Lola this very day, a double portion is coming your way. God often speaks to me through movies, but he does. <clears throat> Last night, Michael and I were watching The Sound of Music, and uh, the, the dad, he was a captain in an army, and when he called his children, they each had a sound on a whistle, <clears throat> and each of them had a different one, and when he made the sound for that child, they stepped out and they marched down to their place one by one. And at first, the Fräulein, Julie Andrew, she didn't understand. And I know, I know he softens a bit in the movie, but there's a purpose to what he was doing. And she said, you know, children don't need a sound. You know, they, they call them by their name call them by their name. And he said, Fräulein, this is a very big grounds here. And when I do the sound, they know. I don't have to yell. They know their sound. And I just heard that today that it was a military thing like that he was doing with his family. And God is Papa God, but he's also God of the angel armies. And we're a part of the army of the Lord. So he's one, <laughs> one father, but he's also Lord. He's also over the army. And I feel like the Lord is doing today. He's beginning to sound forth that, that sound that lets you know it's time to get in place. And he's doing it all across the place. Because every people are scattered right now they're scattered all over the place and God is saying let me make the sound because when you hear that certain sound that certain sound not just any sound but when you hear that certain sound then whatever you're doing stops and you get ready and you and you stand at attention you're not standing at ease you're standing at attention because God is saying something this morning God is calling forth the army and you have the option to listen and to stand in and take your place. So that's what we're singing this morning. Does that make sense? And I don't wanna miss my place. I don't wanna miss my place. If the captain of the angel armies is speaking, I'm standing at attention. What are you saying? I'm here. He 
could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the
We give you honor. We give you glory. We give you praise. Oh, because when the king enters the room, woo, when the king enters the room, all we can do is bow and praise his holy name. And I'm telling you that Jesus, Jesus Christ, the living God, the living Son is here. He is here. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I'm telling you, whatever you need this morning, you ask it now. Ask it now in his name. Oh, the one who went and paid the price. The one who went and hung and died for you. Oh, Jesus.
turns away wrath and when he speaks harsh to you just say something kind God says I'm dealing with his heart I'm be changing that situation he is beginning to soften even though you don't see it he will now let's just continue the worship but if that word was for you and you know God's speaking to you, maybe it has to do with your marriage, your back, or whatever that call was. If that was for you, you just come forward and we're gonna to continue to be in worship while we pray with you right now and you receive your blessing. So you come on up now. About the marital situation there are two parents that are in the room two different sets of parents that you're praying right now for your children's marriage that there's something that's really out of order if that's you you just put your hand on your heart receive that blessing for them right now
Lord, what else is there to live for but to worship and adore you? What a privilege it is. Lord, I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your presence this morning. Mm. You are El Shaddai, more than enough for everything we need. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. What a day to be with Jesus. What a day to be in the presence of the Lord. Glory, glory, glory. Well, it's my opportunity to encourage and exhort you to give your tithes and offerings and love offerings this morning. The Lord gave me two little scriptures. I know y'all are proud he didn't give me the whole Bible because he has done that a time or two. But anyway, Genesis 9, 7, and this is after Noah and them come out of the ark and everything. He says, and as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Now, we think of that mostly as having children, and I'm way past that, but um, I mean, I hope I am. Lord have mercy. That'd be something else, wouldn't it? <laughs> but I think God is a God of multiplication. I think that he wants us to be fruitful and multiply in lots of areas, not just money, not just children, not just fruits and vegetables, but in every area of our lives. Then he gave me this scripture, and I'm telling you, it, uh, <laughs> it was a little bit shocking when he gave me this one because I like that other one better. But anyway, it was John 12, 24. It says, most, uh, mo most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And he who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, my daughter sent me a little love offering for Mother's Day. She was a little late because her husband didn't get it in the mail in time. And so I have my little offering from that this morning. And you know what? I could buy two blouses if I held on to this. But I can only buy one blouse if I don't hold on to this and put it where it's supposed to be. But you know what? I've walked with God long enough to know that if I hold on to this, this is all I'm going to have. It's all I'm going to have. And I might could buy me, I might could go through, I don't even know if I could go through McDonald's anymore and buy a Happy Meal with it. But anyway, if I put this, if I put this into the ground and let it die, you know what? I guarantee you before the summer's out, I'll have more than two blouses. I guarantee you it'll multiply because God is a God of multiplication. So this morning, as you're making out your checks and your envelopes to the dwelling place, I want you to have great faith in your heart that whatever you're releasing into the ground, it is going... Let me see how that says that again. Let's see here. But if it dies, it produces much grain. So I want you to come and bring your tithes and offerings this morning and expecting much multiplication for what you release into the kingdom of God this morning.
stretch our hands towards this. Lord, you are so absolutely amazing and the way you've thought out things and the way you've put these principles in the earth for us. And so, Lord, we just thank you that you give us the opportunity to release our seed into the soil for it to die and come forth and bring abundantly. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have helped us have grace to release it. We trust that you will multiply it and every need of the kingdom will be met in Jesus' power. Powerful name. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, one more time. How are we doing this morning? Hey, there it is. There it is. We're alive. I want to make sure you hadn't fallen asleep in the glory, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I only have uh, two announcements. Uh, the last solutions class is this Wednesday, okay, and we want you to come, okay? It doesn't matter if you've come before. We want you to come. So last night of solutions, it really has been a um, boot camp. We took 13 weeks and piled it into five, and um, it's been absolutely incredible. We've had a great time. It's been great teaching. Um, a lot has been accomplished, and there's tons of people that come in and out of these doors uh, every week, and it's been absolutely incredible. So um, this Wednesday night, 630, last solutions class, okay? So mark your calendars. Bring a friend. It's going to be awesome. Um, we've got Wow Wednesdays. Everybody say Wow Wednesday. And that's coming back in June, okay? So in June, we're going back with the Wild Wednesdays. It's going to be a really, really awesome time. And um, we're looking forward to that here from some new people. You know, Wow Wednesday is our Equip and Empower time. It's where we get to hear from the people that we stand and sit and worship with every day. And we get to see their, uh, a little bit of their testimony and what God's put on their heart. And, you know, when you're going into battle, you want to know who's standing beside you. You want to know uh, what they've been through, what they're going through, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what your strengths are, what, their, what your weaknesses are, so that y'all can complement each other and so that we can go out there and do what God has called us to do. Um, June 14th um, is the last thing I want to mention. And every other Friday night... And during the summer, we are going to be doing throne room prayers for Pensacola, okay? And we're partnering uh, with some other churches in town. Uh, this uh, June 14th is actually going to be at the House of Prayer for All Nations. And the whole concept is we're going to pray. You know, a lot of people are contending for revival right now, okay? A lot of people uh, want revival. But it's one thing to want something, and it's one thing to pay the price to have it. And no move of God in the Scripture or in the last 100 years, 200 years in, in time, has not been paid without a price. And that price is normally time. And it's laying on your face, and it's getting real, it's repentance, and it's getting with a group of people laying down all boundaries, all denominations, all specific beliefs, and you're saying, God, if we don't have you, if you don't come and move, we're not going to be able to make it. We're not going to like the, you know, the world our kids grow up in. If we don't have revival, what are we, you know, what are we living, leaving to little Havela and Ellie? What are they going to grow up in? So we are contending this summer, every other Friday night, for God to move in Pensacola. It's not mandatory. It's not something you have to be at. But I'm telling you, if you sow the seeds, just like Mama was saying, if you sow the seeds now, we are going to reap a harvest. And it is going to be imp uh, amazing. And it is going to be incredible. And it's going to be everything that God has said is coming. But to think that we're going to get it without any cost to ourselves is wrong. Okay? So I encourage you, June 14th, um, it's going to be at 7 o'clock, and that's at the House of Prayer for All Nations. There's a little card on the back if you want to pick it up. It's got the name on there. I think I have the addresses on there as well. And we're just going to be flip-flopping every other Friday night um, with them and then with our place. And we're just looking for people who are hungry, who want to pray for God to do what he wants to do in the city. Not what we want him to do. But what he wants to do in this city, because it's only what he wants to do that's going to change the city and is also going to change the nation and the world. Amen? Amen. So without further ado, we've got Dr. Russ back in the house with us this morning. Give it up to him.
going on, uh, students that are, uh, that would come away. We got it. How's that? Hello. Yeah. yeah. You know what? A couple of you be praying now that the sound goes down and my battery runs low. I got a 35-point message, and we're going to get every one of them this morning. Now, cut it out. Woo. Woo. That be talking about like wearing down the saints, man. So they're really coming together. We refuse to sign the paper, right? So obviously we're on their hit list, and we're on their non-fund list. So we have to have a lot more volunteers these last two years. Now, we're also fighting legislatively for the church, like when I went to Ottawa, because we're looking to reverse that rule. They also, you, how many of you saw Unplanned? They haven't seen it in Canada. They won't allow it to come in. They're frightened. So now the church is bringing petitions around petitioning to get them to bring it in and they're trying to fight it but it's a long battle it's an extremely liberal government socialized they look a lot like us and they speak english in certain provinces but it's a completely different system okay it's the greatest mission field in the western hemisphere i honestly believe that so we got a lot of family and friends that are up there so let's make sure we keep them in prayer and uh you know uh Yesterday, uh, a good prophetic brother, a wonderful man of God, uh, went to be with the Lord. Uh, many of you know Johnny Foote, who has been a long-term prophetic voice here in the city. And uh, uh, he went and received his reward yesterday. So glory to God. Things are, let's keep his family, his family, his children and all in prayer. But, you know, uh, uh, over the years, we know the relationship that Pensacola has had with the prophets. So we know that he really plowed some hard ground and made some inroads. Probably, how many of you touched by his ministry and life here in the right? We all were. I mean, just a real, real wonderful. So keep his family and all in prayer, and that's important. I know that there's a couple of you right now that, are, uh, that have some sick relatives and some people that aren't here with us today. Let's just lift them up right now as we lift up... Uh, Johnny Foote's family. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the man of God. I thank you for the commitment that he and his family made to plow the hard ground here in this region as a prophetic voice and a prophetic leader, the hearts and the lives of the people that they touched. We pray right now for the family, Lord, that there be that perfect shalom, that perfect peace. We don't understand a lot of things, Lord, but by faith, we believe and we press in for that perfect peace, that perfect shalom on everyone involved, that understanding of what we don't yet know and have not yet seen. We press in with that supernatural life-giving hope and faith. And Father, we lift up all of those that are, are going through any sickness in their families and their health right now. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to bring healing to them today in Jesus' name. Now, this Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday is uh, uh, the Mama Hug Wow Wednesday time. I know y'all been getting blessed. Now, this Wednesday, part of what she's going to be sharing on this Wednesday has to do with church wounds, church hurts. I'm sure ain't nobody here been hurt in church. <laughs> well, I don't want to hear you complain if you're not going to come out and get your healing. Amen. Right? She's here to bring healing to us this week for church wounds. And you, you know, I've been in church a long time. Huh? So I get my share. So I'm going to be here on Wednesday. Make sure you come on out. And don't worry about the complaint and come and get your healing. All right? Because she has a tremendous inner healing anointing. Let's give her a great big hand. She's been blessing our socks off and our family. So glory to God. Now, I shared with you uh, this season... You know, sometimes we start 
looking at things uh, sometimes in the West, but all over the church and, and probably all over the religious communities. You look at those holidays, and of course we think of Passover and, and Easter as the most holy time and season, Resurrection Sunday, and, and then we kind of feel like it's, it's over, but it's not really over, all right? That was actually the beginning of a new day and a new season, and it stretches in to the most powerful moment in the history of the church, to the birthing of the church, to the day of Pentecost. Next Sunday, I'm going to share a little bit on the day of Pentecost and on that season in between. Because I want to encourage you right now to lean on the heart of God during this season. Don't get caught up in all the hoopla and everything that's going on and think, oh, it's over. It ain't over. This, it was during this 50-day season that he revealed himself to so many people in resurrection power. It's a season when he will reveal himself, his will, his purpose for you, but you got to press into him here, right? Sometimes we back up thinking it's done. We need to press in because it's only just begun. We are moving up to that powerful moment of the power of Pentecost. And I'm going to share a little bit about that next Sunday. And uh, I, I've been talking some about this great shift that's happening and the, the changes that are happening in the church and the, the next group of leaders that's coming on the scene and how the uh, you know, how the prophetic army, end time army, is going to blend together. And we're going to see the paradigms of all the old prophetic mantles coming together. One in particular that I've spoken to you about and mentioned a few times is the prophetic mantle of the sons of Essachar. Huh? Hey, and uh, sometimes we hear that and, you know, we can get a witness that, yeah, that is. Okay, but what does it mean? to me today. How does it have some relevance here? Who were these sons of Essachar, right? They knew what it was that Israel was supposed to do and they became the leaders, the tribe of Essachar, the sons of Essachar. So I'm going to share a little bit on that because I believe that that's the generation that's coming out. We have an, a disappropriate number of leaders in our body. I believe that God's first going to prepare and equip the leaders and then send the followers and send the people. Can I get an amen? All right. Now, I happen to believe in the priesthood of the believer as well, that we're all anointed and we're all called. That's what Pentecost is all about. You're anointed and the power of God is within you. So we want to see what God is, is going to do with all of that. But these sons of Ezekiel are on my mind. They, that is going to be the prophetic leadership that comes out. There were like 200 of them in that tribe. And I want to share a little bit with you this morning. Let's go first to... So just so we can get a feel of what that might mean to us. To us that have ears to hear. To us that are willing to change and grow. To us that are willing to go against the status quo. What does it mean? See, these mantles stay in the earth. And the mantle for the sons of Ezekiel is going to come on the entire company. And the end time paradigms of each of these ministries are going to come alive in multiple form. Not just in certain leaders, but widely across the body as we step into a season of body ministry. No names, no faces. You know what? We say that and we've been saying that for years. Yet still there's an elitist mentality of clergy and laity that's rooted even in Pentecostal charismatic circles. And he's getting rid of that. And the whole entertainment thing and all the titleistic crazy nonsense that goes on and entitlement mentality, he's getting rid of that stuff. And he's getting us back to the foundations of how church is supposed to be and how we are supposed to be as anointed sons and daughters. So it's a great season. And this new breed of leaders being released in this season, the sons of Ezekiel, who are they? What will they look like? How will they rise up into power? How about their character? And how will they lead? Because we are part of this generation. Some of you in the room, that's what your anointing is for, is to be the head and not the tail. 
He's taking you out of an obscure, obscure position. You're hidden in the quiver of the Lord. Maybe you've been on pause, you've been on hold, you've been on whatever. Maybe you were out of season, but now is your time. Rise up. And he'll make up the difference in time. But we've got to come to the place, who am I? What am I about? What is it supposed to look like? And what is my gifting and calling? To start with, let's go back to Genesis 49.1. And let's see these sons of Ezekiel. See, Jacob, Jacob was old at that time. And he wanted to gather together his sons, his children, his heirs. He wanted to declare their destiny and declare their legacy. Jacob gathered them together to pray and to prophesy over them and the tribes that they would fully become. Jacob was a strong father. He didn't, he didn't just mess around with words and pat them all on the back, if you know what I mean. That was not the father's heart that was in Jacob. Jacob was a tough dude, and he wanted to share with them what their destiny would be and their families, their children and their children's children. And he spoke straight to them. Jacob, it says in 49, 1 and 2 of Genesis, and Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. He said, gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. So he was old and he gathers his sons together, each one of them to speak about their destiny and their legacy. He prayed over them and he spoke about the things were to come in the last, and he put in there, he said, in, in the last days. He didn't say just in your future. He said in the last days there too. So I believe that this can also give us a little insight of how this generation, how this particular tribe, how this particular anointing and mantle is going to manifest in the end days and what it may look like to give us a little bit of insight. Let's go now to the NIV. I did that out of the King James, but just to do a little, just to clarify a little better. Let's go to 49, 14, and 15. And now it's Ezekiel's turn. Since Ezekiel is a raw bone donkey lying down among the sheep pens, when he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. All right? I don't know what Ezekiel was thinking. But first he says, yo, oh, Ezekiel, you and your kids, the donkey. The donkey. Wait a minute, that ain't the way to start out with me, right? But it sure must have got his attention. And the donkey's important. Every part of what he said is going to be fulfilled. He declared that in the power of the spirit within him as he gathered together his legacy and declared it. This was his declaration over the sons of Ezekiel, which I believe are going to be coming out in this season. Let's see what he said. How would you like it? How'd you like it that is say, Jody? You and yours, you're the donkey tribe, dude. <laughs> let's look at a few things. At that time that he said that, let's forget the donkey for a minute. We'll come back to the donkey. He didn't know what land it would be, but he said it would be a good land. He, it's actually, he brought, he brought Ezekiel a really good word. I mean, a really good word. He told him some really good stuff about his future. He didn't know at that point, but he said, this is a good land. He said, it, and, and he didn't know, but it included the Jezel, Jarel Valley, which is the most desirable, fertile, well-watered 
a wonderful land for agriculture and raising animals, a grazing land. How many of you have been to Israel and to that whole beautiful valley? That was going to come as the inheritance for the sons of Ezekiel. Not only did he declare that, uh, that there would be good land, but he also said that he and his children would value that land. See, because sometimes you can receive an inheritance or a present and you don't really get a concern or an understanding of just how important and how good that is. There have been times that I've got prophetic words and when I see them fulfilled, I have to repent because when I received them, I didn't see them for what they were. I received it, but I didn't receive it, if you know what I'm saying. Right? There's a really receiving it. That's when, you know how you know when you received it? When you wrap your heart and your life around it and you value it so much that you're willing to give up a piece of your life for the fulfillment of that. He said they were going to value the land. They would value the land. Not only am I going to give you a good land, but I am, you're going to know the value of it. And not only are you going to know the value of it, but you're going to appreciate it so much that you're going to bow your shoulder down and carry the burden. In other words, they were not going to be afraid to work the land. They valued it enough to work the land, to do the work of the ministry, to bear the burden of his calling. See, some of us, we like to have that calling. We like to get that prophetic word. We like the goosebumps. We like what it says. We like the title. But do you value it and love it enough to pick up the burden that comes with that calling and actually go to work and produce something with the land God gave you? That's when you know that somebody appreciated the gift God gave them. Hello? Don't just hang it in the closet. Don't just put it on a shelf but value it enough to bow your shoulder and take the burden of that calling and turn it into something great. It's important that we begin to understand it all. He could have looked at it like it was a curse, but he didn't. He perceived it as a divine opportunity. Hmm? We have to change the way we view things. Otherwise, we'll be sitting around nitpicking, complaining, murmuring about our particular inheritance compared to Rob's inheritance, compared to Sister Lila Tahoon's inheritance. Hello? We need to see the divine opportunity in the midst of it, value it, bow our shoulder and carry the burden of the calling to turn it into what God wants. See, God gives it to you. I remember one time these people came to the camp. It was only in the, it was about the third season, and, and we were really getting it ready. It certainly didn't look anything like it looks right now. But I remember we were hanging out, and we were having a cookout, and these guys were there talking, a bunch of couples, and, and one guy says, man, God then really bless you. Man, he gave you this beautiful place. And all that. I said, yep, he did. I, I can't tell you how thankful I am that God gave us this. I said, it's a fruitful land. We've had great time with it. It's beautiful. I said, but I still remember seeing when God had it all by himself. <laughs> Hello? Sooner or later, you got to bow your shoulder and bear the burden. Work ain't no dirty word. All right? Come on now. Carry that burden. It's the works of ministry. Not works of religion. We were saved by faith, but we were saved with the purpose of doing good works unto God. Amen? Amen. Not religious works, not your sacraments. That's not what I'm talking about. He called him a strong donkey. And donkeys are strong, and they're strong-willed, and they can be stubborn. And stubbornness can be a real hindrance, but at the same time, being strong-willed can be a great asset when you're fighting obstacles and hindrances. 
He said he would lie down with the sheep. See, the donkey in the Middle East, in the midst of the sheepfold, became a protector of the sheep and bonded very closely with the shepherd. So here the sheep are there, and the donkey would lay down right in the middle of the sheep. Now, of course, the shepherd, that's his time. He's going to get some rest and get some sleep. But when the predator comes, the donkey starts to make that noise real loud. Wake up the shepherd. Alert the flock. You know, the bray of the, of the, of the donkey. And no matter how big the predator, hello, that donkey knew how to do some business. Come on now. If you ain't never been kicked by a donkey, you don't know quite what I mean. Huh? That donkey is an important part of the sheep's team to help him shepherd the flock. That loud bray it alerts the flock, the shepherd, to defend them even to the death. Ezekor and the sons of Ezekor would be like Judah's choice to protect God's sheep at the most dangerous time in world history. And in the end times, we are in the end times, one of the most dangerous times in world history. So the donkey is going to lay in our midst. The sons of Ezekiel are going to lead. From the inside out, they're going to come forth as great leaders in this season. I'll tell you how wonderful the donkey's role is compared to what we think. Turn to Zechariah 9.9. 9. And this is a portrait of the donkey as well. He says, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Hmm. Mm-hmm. The donkey played a key role. I believe that the tribe signified if the donkey is going to be a part of what ushers in the second coming of the Lord. They're going to bear the burden of the ark coming back into the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. They're going to be part of that whole new prophetic army. Matthew 21, 5 called them a beast of burden. In this season of great transition for the nation of Israel, and you say, what transition? Well, how about the transition between David and Saul? There was a great transition that was going on between David and Saul. There was a time of internal strife that's going on. They knew the signs and the times and the wisdom and the heart of God. And they stood stubbornly with David at Hebron at a great turning point in the nation. Go to 1 Chronicles, I believe it's 1 Chronicles 12, 23. It said, these are the numbers of armed warriors who joined David at Hebron. They were all eager to see David become king instead of Saul, just as the Lord had promised. Verse 32, from the tribe of Ezekar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and they knew the best course for Israel to take. The sons of Ezekar knew how to be on the right side. See, Saul was Israel's king. David was God's king. God gave Israel Saul because of their desire to have a king like the other nations. 
And they would like Saul because Saul was big and strong and looked like a king. So he would look like a king to the other nations around. But he wasn't God's king. God gave in to him. God's king was David. A little ruddy-faced guy on the backside of nowhere, tending the sheep. He couldn't fight with Saul's armor. Hello? Saul said, here, take my armor. He didn't know what to do with that armor. It didn't fit him. You know what fit him? Was the weapons of warfare that his daddy that gave him, that God gave him to fight in the wilderness. Hello? We've been looking for Saul's armor. We're looking for the king to be high, the big thing, the big deal, all the shots, all the... Hello? Knock, knock. You're going to be surprised when we get done here, who's who? I'm not talking about here. I'm talking when we get done here in the earth and we go face to face with Jesus, we're going to be real surprised who knew him and who didn't, who obeyed him and who didn't, because there's a lot of silly nonsense going on all across the body of Christ. And he is rising up from within and bringing them forth that are going to lead in this season. What a time we live in. What a pivotal moment. They became the heads. 200. It says, look at what it says here. And the children of Ezekiel, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Now, according to biblical commentaries, See, where, where he said there, let's, let's think a minute about this. He said there that they had an understanding of the times, the seasons and the times. Let's think for a minute, Middle Eastern time back then. Let's think of Enoch, right? Enoch was a stargazer, dude. You ever read his story? He was a stargazer. What the, the, but you know, you know what? That was the way... They had an understanding of the times and seasons was by looking at the stars, right? They were like astronomers, right? And, and there were a lot of them. How about the wise men? We're not talking about a bad thing here. The wise men knew where Jesus was because they understood the signs and the times and the seasons because they had an understanding. In other words, they were well-trained and prepared. See, you, you, you think, yeah, well, I'm just going to rise up and God's going to do all this wonderful stuff. But are you really prepared? Amen. Are you prepared to lead? See, he was preparing the sons of Ezekiel to lead. He's trying to prepare you to lead. Are you going to get ready? You got to know what you're going to do. You got to know who you are. You got to know what your legacy is. You got to know your place in the body. But you also need to be equipped. You need to be trained. You need to be prepared. So that when that opportunity presents itself, you're able to capitalize on it to the fullness and let not let stuff fall through to the ground. They were trained. They also knew the Torah. Hello? Hey, they were well learned, well trained, hard working, prepared for a special moment in time. How many of us have heard it said about born for such a time as this? That's one thing. But have you allowed yourself to be prepared to take full opportunity of that moment in time for you? Hello? Are you in that place of preparation? How are you with the word? How are you relationally with the Lord? How are you in the body? How's your discipleship walk? What's the fruit of the spirit really look like in you? Hello? What are you allowing him to work on and work through? Are you really being prepared? Are you being equipped? Are you being empowered? Are you being made ready? Because the moment in time is at hand. And when it happens, you don't got time to run back and say, yeah, Jesus, I'm going to come and serve you, but I got to go to Bible school for three years. Hello? You got to start right now, putting yourself in position to be equipped, to be empowered. Hello? To receive the gifts and the inside and prepare yourself for the burden. Physically, emotionally, mentally, begin to prepare yourself to carry this burden. Begin to work out spiritually. Hello? You're a bodybuilder? How about working out spiritually? 
we're not getting anywhere with the sons of Ezekiel. Didn't mean to get off all on that and everything. Hello. They were hard workers, but they were well-rounded. They were prepared to take full advantage of this opportunity for themselves, for their tribe, and for their nation. To lead. This is a crucial moment in American history. A crucial moment in the kingdom of God. In the church of Jesus Christ, we are under attack from the inside and the outside. He's trying to bring forth a remnant. They studied to show themselves approved. And at that moment, they had the right discernment because they had a relationship with God so that they knew who God's pick was. And they were not deceived by the outward appearance of their leader. They made the right choice in the made decision to stand in the walk with David. What a time and season we're in. These sons of Ezekiel in our generation are going to come to the top at a time and a season of great turmoil, conflict, at a crucial moment in history. Internal struggle, civil war, even within the church, is going to be about the church. He's dropping the plumb line everywhere. He's not just dropping it in a church. He's dropping it in churches, in denominations, in families, in homes, in our own heart. Hello? He is dropping that plumb line everywhere right now. And we need to know what it is. When that transitional moment came, they were prepared to leave, to lead. When the times changed, Ezekiel and his sons knew it. And they assumed their God-given place received their destiny and the legacy that their father had promised. Jacob, what he had prophesied over them. Just like Leonard Ravenhill said, they seized the opportunity of a lifetime during the lifetime of the opportunity. And that's what we need to do. But in order for that to happen, we have to be prepared. Are you willing to bear the burden of your calling? Are you willing to work the land that God's given you? The inheritance that God's given you, do you actually appreciate it and its potential? Do you value it enough to make it a priority in your life? Where does it fit? After your cousins, after your kids, after the ball game, after the beach party? Where is the call of God in your life in priority value? That's what we're talking about. Do you understand the prophetic words that have been spoken? Have you aligned yourself with them? Have you been studying to show yourself approved and prepared for that moment? Are you leaning on the heart of God? Will you make the bold choice to embrace the new and stand against the old during this season of great change. Just ask yourself. Because this is really, it's all, it's just about you and him. And your moment in time. He's about you. He loves you. Church is about you, about empowering you. Equipping you. That's what the leadership is called for. But we need to put ourselves in place. That's, that's you and I reason together here a little bit. I like that scripture. In Isaiah, where it says, let us reason together. We must perceive a river of God in its right context. When you see the river of God, there's a couple things about the river of God, which is symbolic of the life of the spirit. Sister Ruth gave me a great insight into one part of it where she said, no matter where you enter the river, you could enter the river from the same place today that you did last year that you did before. You may be on the same place on the bank. You may be in the same church. You may be in the same city. But every time you step into the river, you step into a brand new place in the river. God's doing a new thing. You may be stepping in from the same place on the bank, 
but you're stepping into a new place in the river. And I want you to know something about a river. Sometimes we look at that river and we think that river ain't got no structure. And that's not true. God is about structure. See, because a river without banks becomes a dangerous flood. God's about structure. Structure in the heavens, structure in the earth, structure in the body. There's an understanding of great structure and free flowing. They're all part of the same thing. And he's a generational God. He wants to do something in our generation. We have to really find out who we are and what we're about, what we want to do, who am I? See, in the, in the midst of where we're standing now in North America, stuff is everywhere, everywhere. Distraction, confusion, rejection. Everything is all around. You can't be a believer today and not be under attack at some point because we are under attack. The enemy is fighting full bore. It comes to a place that I got to know him. Maybe you happen to be prophetic. I want to tell you why. If you're prophetic, I want to, I want to pray for you. You're a prophet, I want to pray for you. I, I've never met a real prophet that didn't suffer from rejection. That is the number one attack that the enemy uses on a prophetic individual, is rejection. Not even recognized in their own country. But he wasn't just talking about your own country. Not recognized in your own family. Not recognized in your own denomination. Not recognized in your own city. Not recognized in your own spiritual and natural family. Hello? Not recognized for the gift and the call. It's on you. Rejected. If you don't learn how to overcome rejection, you'll never fulfill the fullness of the call of God on your life. You can't avoid it. It goes with the mantle. Hello? If they rejected him, they're going to reject us. And the very people he was called to reject him. The ones that he mentored, the sons, they weren't there on the day and in that moment of conflict. Hello? He was rejected even by his own family. He was a man of sorrows who understood sorrow. Paul said, I want to know him in the midst of his suffering. There's no way that you can fully know Christ unless you be willing to suffer with him through those situations that he suffered with to carry the burden of the true call of a man of God. There's a lot of them. Any old call will do. But do you looking for the high call? then you better be willing to pay a price. You better be willing to pick up a burden because it comes with something. You got to value it enough to work it. Prioritize it properly in your life. I want you to know that I love you. I appreciate you. I don't understand fully this season we're in right now. I don't understand the season I'm in for myself. Hello. Compared to where I was a year, two years, three years ago, to, to, to where I am in some other places in the world. But here I am here. Now I got to deal with that. And the only way to deal with that is to deal with this. I got to deal with me. I got to let the Holy Ghost deal with me. Hello? It ain't the body's job to keep the, humble, uh, to keep the prophet humble, but the Holy Spirit knows how to do his job. Can I get an Amen. It ain't your job to keep another man humble. Because every man, every woman needs affirmation. But the Holy Ghost knows the times and seasons in a man's heart. And he knows that that humility will bring forth the great grace that comes to finish the race. We got to know who's who. Because sometimes we in the body of Christ try to play the Holy Ghost. Uh -huh. Come on now. Especially when new folk come into the church and we're trying to convert them. To us, to our church, to our doctrine, instead of unite their heart together fully with Christ. All right, come on now. So it's a great moment that we're in, but a very conflicting moment. I love you. I believe God is going to do something in this city. I believe it's a crucial time in the city. I believe that what we do now over the summer, see, because summer typically is a layback, lazy time in this area, in this whole region. Huh? We're going to see where you put your priorities. 
By the way, we're all being tested. I ain't the only dude around here getting tested. He's testing every one of you. And he's testing your spouse. He's testing your kids. Huh? He's testing brothers and sisters in the church. Bear with them. I don't get after them. You start getting after them because you see what they're going through, and the next thing you know, you, you want to start bring correction against them. Hello? You're going to be reaping stuff on yourself. You know what? One time I, 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 was, I was crying out about, God, will you deal with my wife? Boo, 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 boo. He said, you leave her to me because me and you got a lot of unfinished business. <laughs> you, just let, you just deal with God. And God, let the Holy Spirit know how to deal with us because he's dealing with every one of us. He's finding out who we really are and trying to reveal our true self and identity to us more than anybody else. Let's lift our hearts to the Lord. We're going to have a good week next week, too, talking about, talking about this season of revealing himself. And, Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this season. We thank you for the mantle. We thank you for what you're doing and the gifts that you've given us and the land that you've given us. We thank you for the inheritance, Lord. And, and Father, we choose now in our own hearts. And you choose right now, you and him together. You choose right now. Are you willing to bow your shoulder and pick up the burden of your calling? Are you willing to study, to show yourself approved, to lead, and to take advantage of this moment? Here we are, Lord. I lift my hand to you and say, Lord, prepare me, equip me, empower me, that I may show myself approved, that I may prioritize life properly according to your gift, your calling to me, my relationship with you. Here I am, Lord. You see my hand and you know my heart. You know my heart. You know our heart. You hear our hearts right now. And whatever it is that's on your heart, whatever it is you're willing, whatever it is you're questioning, whatever it is you're going through, just you and him right now. Just you and him. I love the corporate setting and worship and prayer, but I also know that he's an intimate God and he wants to know what you right now in the quiet of your heart declare who you are in him what you're really willing to do here we are Lord you hear our hearts you're all about our hearts and Father take away anything that's not of you in me I thank you for my faith and I ask you to help me with any unbelief in my being remove it every hindrance, every obstacle that I may fulfill your destiny. That not one seed would fall to the ground, but that the fullness of the harvest would be released in our lives and in every season of our life that we would bear fruit and fruit that lasts. Father, bless your people. Bless them physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. Bless them with dreams and visions and revelation knowledge. Confirm their gifting and their calling this week to them. Confirm them in every way, in everything they do and wherever they go. Let your favor rest upon them. Let the love and the light of the, the Lord. Father, let those divine appointments come right before our eyes and put the words in our mouth that we may extend and advance your kingdom. And we may serve you what all we are, all we have, and all we hope to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And tonight's a holiday weekend, so we won't be here for the Sunday night gathering tonight. And also Father's Day coming up, we won't have a nighttime service on Father's Day. At the Pastor May Center greetings. Yesterday was her birthday. What a wonderful, wonderful sister. I am a blessed man. Uh, and uh, so we'll be 
We're going to be around here a whole lot, so we're going to be here to see you. If you need prayer, if you'd like some prayer before you leave, you feel free to come up for prayer. You feel free too if you want to go in fellowship or it's time for you to go. Enjoy your holiday weekend and use this season, this 50 days, to dig real deep in God and get that fresh revealing and the power of Pentecost be yours. My prayer for you. God bless you. So this Friday, 7 o'clock, the 31st, is our first gathering for prayer. So everybody online, this Friday, right here, throne room prayer at the dwelling place. Uh, we'll see you all at 7 o'clock. Hey, let's